And I shoot my shot, it's the whole wild way it's going in. Cross niggas like Bubba Chuck, I never gave a fuck. Hook shot a hole like Kareem, but I never lead a book. I hit that Janobi with my left hand on like, woo! Bitch, you weren't with me shooting in the gym? Long nights, I perform like Mike. Anyone, Tyson, Jordan, Jackson, action. James Harden with the range on me, nigga, way back. Michael Jordan, 1985, bitch, I travel with a cocaine search. And you could live through anything if magic made it. I gotta close the window before I record because New York don't know how to be quiet. What up, my fellow Knicks fans? This is your guy, Marcellus Ease, and don't panic quite yet. Now, with the city warming up, it's not only a beautiful thing that sundresses are making their return, but also Knicks basketball will be returning to the city with warm weather, and it always feels so, so good. Now, before I get to my weekly quick hits, definitely check out the description below. I know you guys have a lot of different hobbies, interests. We have a lot of different things on the cloud and my weekly gems. You can download straight into your phone. Things like cooking, health, fitness, business, weekly playlist, all that good stuff. Definitely check it out in the description below. Now it's a beautiful thing that the Knicks were able to secure the fourth seed and survive that gauntlet, especially at the end of the season, because that was very important for us to not to go up against Milwaukee in the very first round. But one question I gotta ask myself is what is our identity down the stretch in the fourth quarter? Because since the beginning of the season till about now, We've been kind of struggling to kind of close out these games. And sometimes I'm wondering how comfortable are guys in that position, particularly RJ Barrett and Julius Randle. And do they know exactly what they're going to do in those moments? Because sometimes we don't see the team look as fluid. You can look at the game in LA, the play looked kind of clunky at the end. Guys were all bunched up together. The spacing was poor and we just got a bullshit shot chucked up as an attempt or even before the overtime in that same game we've seen Julius Randle sort of get an awkward shot off to try to win the game the play just wasn't as fluid I mean you could even go back early in the season you look at the games against Miami that Jimmy Butler kind of killed us down the stretch we sort of had an identity struggle into what and who's going to get the ball down the stretch who's making the plays what if Randle has to bail out he's getting double teamed and RJ Barrett down the stretch how comfortable is he because in one of those games against Miami RJ Barrett had a chance to make a last second play but he was unable to do it and he kind of missed the layup a bit but I'm wondering how often has he been put in that position where he can be assertive and comfortable to live and die with that play and I seen him make a comment before in a post game interview which he was talking about how he's still getting accustomed to being put in that position and living up to that moment. He's a young player, so it's not just him. You got to also look at Julius Randle because Tibbs likes to run ISO plays through him, especially down the stretch. And we've seen in games like in Brooklyn, when Randle got that travel call, the play looked kind of fluky. And at the last second, he changed his mind and tried to make a pass and that's how that play kind of happened. But the Knicks were kind of clunky at the end. So with these countless examples, this is why I keep asking myself, what is our identity? Especially coming down the stretch going into these playoffs. As we know, these scenarios are going to keep coming up. And I'm hoping that Tibbs is not scared to at least run plays as maybe a third or fourth option for guys like Reggie Bullock or Alec Burks to come up with an open jump shot or even just a play to make things happen at the end of games. Also, if Tibbs potentially just opens up the floor more for other guys to contribute on a last second play, it kind of takes the pressure off of Randall's shoulders to feel like he has to make something happen because things get way too clunky in clutch moments when Randall feels like he has to make the play no matter what, or he has to get a shot off. There has to be a much easier play to make. And I want guys to enter the floor in a clutch situation with a clear and concise play. Like, we're going to do this. This doesn't work. We have a plan B. I don't want things to be so clunky like we've seen in the game in Brooklyn, like we've seen in the game in L.A., the, the games in Miami, 
and games here and there sprinkled throughout the season, we've seen, you know, quite a few times things get a little murky at the end. And that's just identity issues on the offensive side of the ball closing the fourth quarter. We got to talk about defensively or just holding on to a lead. These are things that we're kind of struggling with, which is another reason why I keep asking, what is our identity down the stretch? I mean, you look at the games recently against the Celtics, we should have closed out that game a lot easier than what we did. I know Tibbs had a stretch down that fourth quarter where he took the starters out, but still, that game should have been a lot easier to close out than what it was. But there's still other examples. You could look at our last few games of the season, particularly against Charlotte. The closeout in the fourth quarter was kind of clunky at the end. And the same thing for the San Antonio Spurs. We were up by two possessions, but we gave up an and one at the very end to keep the game a little bit closer than what it needed to be and gave the Spurs another opportunity to at least tie the game. And even going back to the game in LA, there was a few possessions in the fourth quarter where we were up and we had the ball, but we turned it over without even having a shot attempt. And then also giving up that layup at the very end to no one other than Wesley Matthews. I mean, giving up that offensive rebound was a killer. But at the end of the day in the playoffs, because we're playing the same team in a seven game series night after night, we're gonna have to tighten up in that fourth quarter and just have a game plan that flows a bit better because once again, these guys are gonna be playing each other night after night. Teams are gonna pick up on players' habits and just having an ISO play to Randall at the end of games, it's gonna be way too predictable. And the Knicks shouldn't be afraid to defer to guys like Reggie Bullock or Alec Burks because those guys have been hitting big shots all season. Especially Bullock, we've seen him come up clutch with three-point shots that we really needed in certain parts of the game. And then we've seen Alec Burks, especially in that game in Philadelphia, him carry us to that overtime. And it also in the overtime, he scored most of the points. So deferring to some of these guys, if plays get a bit clunky, or if guys get double teamed like Randall or RJ, it wouldn't be too crazy of an idea to have some of these guys step up and take that last second shot. Now in the playoffs, as the game slows down, and every possession becomes more important, the game becomes more mental. And of course, every team, guys have to kind of fight themselves, maybe being fatigued, maybe they're injured for all the games that they played throughout the season. But the Knicks in particular are gonna have to fight another battle, and that's the refs. All season long, we do not get the benefit of the doubt from the referees at all. Now, of course, young teams have to earn the respect of the referees, but we've seen a lot of inconsistent play calling from the refs saying that we stepped out of bounds when guys were nowhere near out of bounds the games even at the end are kind of clunky because the refs have to keep going back and reversing calls particularly calls that they made against the knicks we seen frank nilakina check in against the spurs at the end of the game and they called a foul on him right away and it allowed the spurs to have at least one more attempt in trying to foul the knicks and then try to tie the game at the end Another example I could throw at you, it happened in the most recent game against Charlotte, in which Alec Burks went for a defensive rebound, and another player in Charlotte was trying to go for the offensive rebound. He ended up pushing Burks out of bounds, but yet the Knicks were just called for just going out of bounds. Even though the refs looked at the replay, Burks was clearly there first, and the other player tried to nudge himself in position, and he clearly bumped Burks out of bounds. He clearly pushed him out of bounds and the ref still gave the ball to Charlotte. We've seen this play out over and over and over. The Knicks not getting any type of respect from the refs. You can even look at the game against Brooklyn when Randall got called for that travel under two minutes and the refs never went back to look at the replay to see if the ball got tipped. Even though it was under league rules that the refs have to go back and look at some of these replays under two minutes. So once again, the Knicks are in an uphill battle against the referees and the perception that they have of the Knicks due to the fact that the media has an ongoing beef with James Dolan and they've been molding the perception of the Knicks as this franchise that is incapable of winning and that is fully dysfunctional. So when there's a close play that happens, I think it goes through the referee's subconscious. Let's rule this close play in favor of the other team and the media will troll the Knicks all day tomorrow, which will justify the call that I made. You know, I thought it was very interesting during one of the Knicks broadcasts, right before the game started, Julius Randle was 
accepting the award for Eastern Conference Player of the Month, Walt Clyde Frazier said something very interesting. He brought up the fact that even though the Knicks had a lot of success this season, we still barely see the faces of Leon Rose or William Wesley or any Knicks front office people. And like I stated in one of my earlier videos, the media has no idea of what moves the Knicks are trying to make, who they're talking to, what are their plans. I mean, you could look at this whole Leon Rose rollout. When he was first hired, he only spoke to the Knicks in-house Madison Square Garden media. That's it. There was no major press conference. There was no national media or any other outlets outside of the MSG studios. And I'm telling you, there's an art, there's a science to this because in this social media clickbait era, a lot of things get taken out of context. And especially with the NBA front offices, when they're potentially talking about trades with other teams, sometimes information gets leaked out. And it seems like Leon Rose and the Knicks front office is taking the same approach that the Lakers and Rob Palenka are doing, or the Golden State Warriors, or any other successful NBA team. They keep things airtight. That's why I knew Magic Johnson was never gonna work out being the president of the Lakers. He was too open about what moves he wanted to make. He was saying too much. He was exposing his poker hands. And this is what the Knicks front office is doing now. They're keeping things airtight. They only speak to their own media. That's why the media low key doesn't like James Dolan because he has his own media. He doesn't necessarily have to go to the Daily News or ESPN. He has his own way of communicating directly to his fans. But once again, Leon Rose is into the art He's into the science of mastering, keeping things airtight and not exposing your poker hands. And keep in mind that he already had a huge reputation with a lot of NBA behind the scenes people, GMs, executives. He already had a very high reputation, so he has to maintain that. So knowing that James Dolan has the heat coming down his back from the media, Leon Rose is operating very strategically and very quietly in the background because any slip up, the media can't wait to throw James Dolan under the bus and they're quickly gonna throw Leon Rose's reputation that he took so long to build up along with it. That's why I keep saying there's an art, there's a science to what Leon Rose is doing because right now he's juggling the toxic national media that wants to come down on James Dolan for anything and he's also juggling the informational age where if I'm talking to this GM, this information could leak out and he could leverage it against another team to try to get a trade that he initially wanted from a different team. So there's multiple aspects that he's juggling here. And at the same time, he's trying to protect his reputation. But one major card that he has in his favor is James Dolan having his own media, which is MSG Networks. So nothing could get misconstrued and nothing could be taken out of context. And he could talk directly to the fan base. Speaking about the Knicks front office, I'm looking around and looking at all the moves that they made since Leon Rose has arrived. And I'm trying to figure out which move was the best one that he made that kind of saved this season. I'm looking at the Nerlens Noel signing. It was kind of right before the season started. It was one of the last few transactions that we did. It didn't really get major headlines, but that was a major signing as we've seen the results now with Mitch Robinson being out and Nerlens Noel having to step up multiple times this season. And he's been one of the key factors of our success this season, low key. The man deserves his flowers and I'm gonna give it to him because I recognize the impact that he had on our squad this season. Once again, especially with Mitchell Robinson being out of the lineup twice. And also another move that kind of saved our season was that Derrick Rose trade. Not only we got rid of Dennis Smith Jr., which wasn't quite a good fit, but Derrick Rose brought a little something different to this team. Not only he took a bit of the scoring load off of Julius Randle, but he also became sort of a middleman between the communication line of Tibbs and the players, particularly the younger players. He could sort of relay information to them in a more relatable way of what exactly Tibbs wants and what's the goal and what's the outcome. Because remember, Derrick Rose's most successful seasons have been under Tibbs. So just looking back at the Nerlens Noel signing and the Derrick Rose trade, these are two transactions that basically saved our season in ways that we couldn't even imagine. I mean, just looking at it, these two signings probably was a difference from us being in the play-in to us being a fourth seed. 
And with us being the fourth seed this season, I'm pretty sure you guys are noticing the Knicks are garnering a lot of attention, particularly on the national stage. And when I say national stage, I'm referring to the media side and also the future free agents throughout the league or any disgruntled players on teams that kind of on their way of asking for a trade. They're sort of on alert right now that the Knicks are a destination that they should strongly consider. And best believe that fourth seed finish with home court advantage in the first round, players throughout the league definitely notice. And I know they noticed because they started seeing a handful of our games on national TV, particularly the last few Sundays of the season. Now in the first half of the season, the Knicks were only on national TV once. For the second part of the season when the scheduling came out, and trust me, it was flex scheduling for ESPN or ABC or all the national networks. They were handpicking the Knicks games. The Knicks were never on their scheduling, but they switched it and started picking Knicks games to air. And best believe, there was a lot of attention on the Knicks and all the proof came in when the TV ratings came back. The numbers don't lie. Them numbers, them numbers. Now peep this. The Knicks Clippers game for the week of May 2nd through May 9th was the highest rated game. And when you look at the other games that was on the schedule with bigger stars that are way more promoted throughout the league than what we have. You could look at the Warriors and Pelicans were up on a national stage that week. The Nuggets Lakers in which LeBron returned. The Nuggets Jazz, which is two very fast paced, very good teams that played each other. We outranked all these teams in ratings. Once again, Knicks fans, understand your value, understand your energy. You're like no other fan base in the league. And best believe future free agents and disgruntled players throughout the league are taking notice. And they're gonna want some of that potential money that could be made. And most importantly, they want that attention. I mean, shit, you could make the argument that Julius Randle this season got more love than players that have made multiple All-NBA teams and multiple All-Star appearances. He's gotten more love, more media attention than some of these guys. Once again, New York City is a very unique market and the Knicks fan base is very unique. Look at Lynn's sanity. It was never duplicated after he left New York City. There's a reason for that. This fan base is like no other. And when you sprinkle team success, on top of that, you basically get liquid gold. And there's gonna be a lot of players throughout the league that's gonna to wanna to be part of that. And last but not least, I wanna talk about the Atlanta Hawks. This first round matchup is gonna be very unique because Atlanta's a real bad defensive team, but offensively, they're really on point. We're pretty much the opposite, but our offense this season has been in the middle of the pack. But it's still unique for a number of reasons. We're 3-0 and against them, and the Hawks this season, they kinda of had two different seasons within one. They had a coaching change. Nate McMillan took over. And because they've been dealing with a lot of guys with the pandemic issue, getting sick, and also a lot of guys getting injured, guys like Cam Reddish, Brogdon, Gallinari, it seems like for them, things are kind of coming together towards the end of the season. But this team is still kind of shaky because they're kind of an up and down team. I don't know, once again, because they might not have had all their guys together at once to get that chemistry down. But the Atlanta Hawks do not need Trey Young to drop 30 points a night in order to win. This team spent a lot of money in the offseason as they had the most to spend, and they got guys that can help Trey Young get to that level without having to drop 30 points a night. So that's the difference between this Atlanta Hawks team from last year and this year. So looking at some of the Hawks' strengths, they're a good fourth quarter team. And that's where it could really hurt us because us, we kind of struggle within the fourth quarter. And they're also a good home team. On the road, they're not as strong, but at home, they've been really solid this whole season. Even though they've been dealing with a lot of injuries and a lot of guys in and out the lineup due to the pandemic situation. This team is also very deep. They got Lou Williams, Brogdon, Gallinari, Kevin Hurrier, Cam Reddish. But Cam should not be available for this series. He got a sore Achilles situation, so he most likely will not play in this series, which is a good thing for us. But they also got Capella, which is also dealing with the same injury. But he should be able to play in this series against us right now. And of course, they have John Collins, which early in the season, him and Trey Young were beefing back and forth but they seem to kind of get over that right now. Like I said before, the Atlanta Hawks had two different seasons within one year. So things are kind of beginning to gel for this team. 
and guys are starting to come back into the lineup. That's why this whole situation with the Hawks is kind of hard to judge. Even though we went 3-0 against them, it doesn't fully tell the whole story. And also, going through a head coaching change with Nate McMillan halfway through the season, he got them playing at a different level, and he has them more gelled together. Now, one of the Hawks' biggest weakness is team defense, and that pretty much starts with Trey Young. Sometimes he's turnover prone, which for us is a good thing. The only thing with the Knicks, sometimes on transition offense, we're not as good at finishing. And we've seen that happen throughout the season. But having guys like Nerlens Noel, he can definitely stop guys like Trey Young from attacking the basket and getting to the hole, as Trey Young is not a good finisher at all. He's not that good of a finisher. So getting him off the three-point line and having him drive to the lane, having him try to finish over Nerlens Noel, or even Mitchell Robinson, if he comes back, those odds are gonna be more in our favor. And like I said before, the Hawks are not good on the road. So us having home court advantage is to our favor, and we gotta value those games. The first two games, we gotta come out on point because this team is not a good road team. But on the other hand, they are very good at home. So also another disadvantage the Hawks are gonna have, especially in the playoffs, is that guys like Trey Young won't get those cheap little tic-tac fouls that he's used to getting in the regular season. You know, it amazes me how Trey Young, for such a young player, gets those type of calls. When I see other guys like Ja Morant don't really get those type of calls, but guys like RJ Barrett, who stay taking the ball to the hole, getting bumped by bigger guys, don't get the type of cheap calls that Trey Young gets. But once again, good thing for us, those type of calls do not happen as frequent in the playoffs. So Trey Young in this series could probably do his best imitation of being an East Coast version of James Harden, where he doesn't play as well in the playoffs because he's not getting those ticky tack fouls. But of course, within that scenario, there's the opposite side, and that is the Atlanta Hawks no longer need Trey Young to drop 30 points a game to win these games because they have guys that can kill us, particularly from the three point line, like Gallinari, Brogdon, and shit, even Lemon Pepper Lou. He should feel right at home in Atlanta. Hopefully, he gets too comfortable where he doesn't perform as well in our series. Oh, snap. Lemon pepper wet? It is what it is. With a whole week off, we're going to get some injury updates on guys like Capella, Mitchell Robinson, Cam Reddish, and then we'll begin to get a full picture of what this series is going to look like. And definitely, everyone, don't forget to check out the channel homepage, particularly under the playlist tabs. You'll see other videos that I do pertaining to around the league and other series that you guys could definitely check out about the NBA. And don't forget to join the Panic Discord or sign up for the email list for the call-in shows so you get all the info you need to call up so we can chop it up. Until next time, you guys stay safe. Peace.